there is not one of us that is not at least somewhat affected by feminism. It's like fluoride being in the water. I don't think feminists think that they want to be men, but it takes an outside perspective, say, taking a step back from our time and saying, what is timeless femininity and timeless masculinity look like? And what's happened recently? What's happened? I mean, Our Lady of Fatima warned us the the last battle is on marriage and family. You take down the woman, you take down the family. You take down motherhood, you take down the family. I mean, it's just, that's that's the process that the devil would love to do. And so because of that, Mary is the answer. I'm here today with Megan Madden, author of Mary, Teach Me to Be Your Daughter, to talk about what it means to be embodied as a woman and how we live authentic femininity. Megan, welcome to Brave New Us. Thank you so much for having me, Samantha. I'm so honored to be here. It's great to be able to talk, especially from so far away, you know. So you're a, you're a homeschooling mother, wife to a theology professor, and you're about to have baby number... Number six. (laughs) Number six. Congratulations. Thank you for speaking with us. Before we dive into the book, could you, I just want to say you share um, some kind of provocative content on Instagram. One of your taglines is the world needs more women who love to be women. Could you explain what you mean by that? Sure. I, so a few years ago, I was looking into the question of what it means to be a woman and doing just my own personal studies, as well as we were in Austria at the time for my husband's studies in theology, and he was teaching there. And I was taking some graduate courses in marriage and family. And my interest was the complementarity of man and woman. And I ended up leaving those studies before finishing the degree because I kept getting pregnant, actually. And I did, I never stopped studying. I kept reading into what the saints and philosophers say about femininity. And I just learned so much. I was looking at the question of what does it mean to be a woman in our modern times? Because I think it's really important to understand our identity, to live a full and good and happy life. And that came was, was, was that there were all these different aspects and qualities of the feminine genius. And I found that the more I knew about them, the more I could tap into those natural God-given qualities that I had. And the more I felt, the more myself I felt. And I wanted to share that with, with other women too, that we can learn about these natural gifts that we have and heal in areas that we need and live out our femininity really well and be the most woman we can be. Yeah, it's beautiful. So let's let's unpack that a little bit. Why does it matter that we are created with a distinctly female body? Right. So it goes all the way back to Genesis, of course, with man and woman being created. And and in that, I think we've come to this point. You know, society has reached this point in modernity where we are wondering what it means to be masculine and feminine or undergoing sort of identity crisis within the culture. We see this within the transgender movement. We see it in what is being given to our children right now. There's so much confusion about who we are. And so recognizing who we are, first of all, comes with something tangible and something to the heart right? Something spiritual. We're made body and soul. So our our bodies are made feminine. We are, we are women. There are two genders, you know, this would be, this would be argued in some circles at this point, but we, we can see from scripture and how we are made that we have man and woman. So it matters. Our body are a part of what make us who we are. So we have body and soul and it reflects our femininity, specifically our receptivity, I would say as women. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about that? What about the female body is special or particular? Right. So femininity is the, well, you know, our major gift as women is our ability, or I guess you could say our, it's not potency. That's not the word I'm looking for, but we can possibly be mothers and we have wombs and our bodies are naturally receptive and they show that we even have a mystery that is shown with us as women because our internal organs, our sexual organs are hidden. They're sacred. They're mysterious. This, this like wraps around 
the identity of women. We're, we're meant to have a sense of mystery about us and that's reflected in our bodies, but it's also how we, uh, as women receive others, receive their hearts. So, you know, we think about being with a girlfriend in a coffee shop and um, just pouring hearts, and like sharing something really deep. As women, we have a natural gift of receiving the other. And um, so this can look like marriage and receiving one's husband, and then eventually, God willing, the miracle of a child. And it also can mean spiritual motherhood of women who are serving their community and giving of themselves in that way and and receiving the hearts of others and nourishing them and nourishing those hearts and caring for them in a maternal way. And then it also can be in, you know, friendship. Like we, we just, as women have this beautiful ability of reception on the ground, in our bodies, and even spiritually of God in our prayer lives. Yeah, that's so... It's so beautiful. And it really builds on the thought of John Paul II and his theology of the body, you know, looking at what do we understand about how we've been created by really receiving the the truth about who we are through our physical body, you know, through the way that we've we've been made. And to kind of go off of that, this idea of of the physical and the importance of the physical in our lives, we don't there are some denominations that sort of denigrate the physical world and lift up the spiritual world. And I would argue the, you know, the secular orthodoxy, that's exactly what they do. They say that the material doesn't matter and it's only our our mind or our spirit, but that's not, that's not the Catholic way. That's not the Catholic truth. We, we believe that we are both our physical selves and that the physical world is good and beautiful and that God created it to speak to us in that. And so when you encourage women to celebrate their femininity, you know, one of the ways that you do that in particular is that you share the difference you believe it makes to wear dresses for everyday mom life. Why does it make a difference what we wear and how does this relate to feminine virtue? Sure. Well, I have to preface this with the most important thing we see this in the gospels is our hearts. It's like just flat out, it's our hearts. And so our feminine hearts matter. Our our ability to tap into the gifts of the feminine genius, recognize them and practice them in our daily lives, in whatever vocation we have, whatever work we have, we have, Edith Stein assures us, we are able to do this as women. So that is the most important thing. One of the things I like to share is the union of body and soul, how when you unify the body and soul, even by way of dress, that affects our psychology. Mm -hmm. And what it down to is it's really only been in modern times that we have this sort of fashion sense that's become so specifically about personal style to the point where everyone has a unique style, which is really lovely. We we need that. It's not just sort of like one fashion, you know, like we've seen in history. It's the third wave feminism that we've seen in the 60s. There's been a lot of stripping of femininity and womanhood, motherhood, et cetera. And with that has come this sort of competition with men. And with that has come an onset of a lot of trousers. I always say trousers because I'm in England and pants, <laughs> it, they just don't say. Pants mean something entirely I, different. But yeah, <laughs> yes, they are. I always wore jeans. I was the jean girl. I wore skinny jeans and my like little tops and that's what I wore. And I never had an, I would not say I was any less close lord or any of that that's not that's not where i'm coming from where where i'm coming from is when i was living in austrian poland i met these women these mothers around me and they dressed so elegantly and so beautifully and yet they were so real and on the ground you know with their eight children and you know doing you know playing and doing all the things and I was so inspired by their loveliness and they never spoke about it. They didn't say, oh, this is, I dress this way, you know, or or whatever. And then I moved to Poland and I saw a similar movement there with a lot of women who were dressing in a sort of very vintage, I would say, elegant way, these mothers. And I thought, this is so beautiful. I, I was really, I was really drawn in by beauty mm-hmm. and a true beauty because it was modest. It was lovely. And it inspired me. And I just thought, I can't dress like that. 
there's no way I can't dress like that. Look at that. That's so pretty. You know, like I can't do that. And then I was like, why not? Why can't I do that? I I'm really drawn in by this beauty. And there's this clear complementarity going on between these mothers and wives and their husbands, like their husbands dressed one way and they dressed another. And it, it was visual. And I just had never seen that before. So I wasn't influenced by social media. I actually, you know, I know in a lot of Christian and Catholic movements, the original motive is modesty. That's beautiful. That came secondarily for me. I was really enticed by this beauty and this expression and the feminine heart because they looked so feminine and lovely and soft. So I started wearing dresses and it wasn't like this whole flip of my wardrobe. It took about 18 months of like slowly switching my wardrobe out and wearing dresses. And I found there were some conclusions to that. There was, there was an experiential knowledge that I never could have had had I not done it. Like you have to do it. Like give it a try first before, because I never would have known. But I was more productive in my day, getting dressed and putting on a lovely dress and feeling beautiful. You know, even when you're a stay-at-home mom, like I'm a stay-at-home mom and I wouldn't, it's not like I was going out all the time or something, but it just felt so nice to get dressed in the morning and say, and this reflects, I'm going to get dressed in, in a way, you know, I'm not going to the office. I would dress a certain way to go to the office why can't I dress for motherhood? And I was really inspired then to continue on with it. And I, I found myself, I still remember the last time I put on a pair of jeans. And if I was like going on, like if I was hiking, you know, Mount Everest or going skiing or horseback riding, I would wear what I need to wear that's appropriate for that activity. <laughs> that's part of modesty is wearing what's appropriate for the activity that you're doing. But but I'm not right now. And I still remember putting on my last pair of jeans and thinking, I actually don't want to wear these. No, I, I feel it. I feel that I'm showing parts of me that I don't want to. They were quite tight, you know? And I was like, actually, I, I, no, I'm, I don't want to anymore. I don't want to wear. And I just, ever since then, I mean, I guess this was over three years ago now, I started wearing dresses and skirts in my day-to-day -day for just regular mom life. And that doesn't mean I don't have loungewear or, you know, what do you wear when you go to the the pool? I wear a bathing suit, you know, I wear a full coverage bathing suit, you know, all of these things. I'm. It's not a slavery. It's in freedom of saying in my day to day, this is what I wear. It has been a reflection of my feminine heart. It has softened me psychologically. I do think what we wear has a deep effect on how we experience the world, who we are, how we're expressing if ourselves to others, right? And when I leave the house too, specifically with my children, to leave the house and to dress in this way, I see a way of showing the dignity of my motherhood that I find my my work to be worthwhile and 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 it's a way to express that dignity. So it's been a huge journey and I like to share it because it's I think actually a lot of women are are kind of experimenting with it right now. I think a lot of us are searching for what it means to be feminine and also how to express that femininity. Yeah. I love the way that you connect it to beauty and being drawn in by that beauty. I think that it that beauty is a gift that women have in a particular way and especially in certain certain circles where there's this emphasis on modesty maybe a little bit too much on modesty instead of a, a state of heart as a simply a state of dress and there's like a, this emphasis oh you have to cover cover up and it sort of doesn't matter or I think moms can get caught up in this like well I might get play-doh on it you know we're gonna get I, I I can't wear that. That's too nice. Like, I have things in my closet that I know. Oh, I love that. I feel so beautiful when I wear that. But I can't wear that around my kids. Like they'll I'll ruin the thing. So then I end up never wearing the most beautiful things that I love, and I end up wearing things that I don't like. And it does it does change the way that you feel about yourself and interact with the world when when you are dressed and ready for the occasion. And I, I love what you said about about motherhood being that occasion to be to be dressed and ready and to to show to show up for that. And and another thing too about the beauty is it kind of reminds me of something that Alice von Hildebrand talks about in I forget which one of her books, but I think it might be The Privilege of Being a Woman. She talks about the cult of ugliness in our society. And she's talking specifically about churches. And that's something I I definitely 
have felt and noticed growing, even growing up, I was Protestant. I was not Catholic and our church was fine, but it was, you know, kind of one of those room. It was also a preschool room. So it had to, you know, serve many purposes. And that was great for the community that was there. But just, just like we, we live in a, a place now where the cathedral is breathtaking. And I, I've heard, you know, people have been converted by walking into these beautiful cathedrals and just being astounded. And I'm sure you have an opportunity to experience that a lot more because things are a little bit older in that part of the world. And in, in the United States, a lot of the churches that were built after a certain time, it's it's almost like they were trying to be ugly. I don't know. It's a, it's, it's a loss yeah. and it's sad. So it, I, I just I really appreciate the things you said about beauty. Yeah, actually, I... So two thoughts on that. The first is I had a friend recently say, I can either get my jeans or my dresses dirty. And I just thought that was so like, that's exactly it. You, of course, you're going to have dresses that are nicer that you're not going to put on. But once you start to like cold wardrobe, then you can have these houses that you still feel lovely. in. But and if they get dirty, you can throw an apron on top. That's like my go-to. The apron is mm -hmm. you can live without it as far as I'm concerned if you're gonna wear dresses <laughs> that there's that note but with the cult of beauty I think this is huge charday I think beauty speaks a thousand words especially right now in our culture because it's so lacking and I think specifically too when a woman is trying to dress in a lovely way and trying to dress beautifully it and it's, it does come off. It is modest. Like she, she's cultivating that virtue of modesty. And that is very beautiful and striking to our society because we've become so far on the other end of right, that. Right. Yeah. And you know, the other thing too, is I'm thinking about this and we're talking about it is there's almost this emphasis on getting things that are, that are cheap. Cause if they get ruined, we can just toss them and then get the next thing. And that really perpetuates the fast fashion culture. So even if there's an element of social justice there, well, and, and these lost sort of skills that were definitely associated more with women historically, like being able to get a stain out of clothes or being able to patch, you know, things and to repair. And so having something that's lovely and nice is almost this thing that we regard as too good for us. And we need to focus on cheaper things, but then that kind of spirals off and perpetuates its own set of issues there. I think so too. And I think it, it also is the cause of very hefty wardrobes that we don't need, mm -hmm. you know, like it's just too many clothes and then, and we're not wearing them. And we wonder why we don't like anything in our closet. Whereas if you're going to buy something that's slow fashion, for instance, like I buy, I was so inspired by the women in Poland. And so there, the, there's these small handmade, you know, Catholic dress shops that they have there. And I just slowly over time have cultivated a wardrobe in that. Now I can't wear it right now because I'm very pregnant, but I have these sort of vintage style clothes that I love from there. And they, they did cost than if I, you know, went to Target or, you know, went to an, another shop, but they're the kind of pieces that I could pass down to my daughters. You know, they're just going to last and last and last. And that's, I mean, it ends up saving you money in the long run. And right now while I'm, while I'm pregnant, I just like to thrift, you know, just do some, thr this dress is thrifted, you know? So lovely. So diving deeper into feminine virtues, we already sort of touched on receptivity and on modesty a little bit, but can we go into that a little bit more? What are the feminine virtues specifically and how do we see these practically lived out? Yes. So in my book, I ended up writing a lot about this. So I took the, I, I wrote about Our Lady because I believe she's the ultimate end of femininity. We want to imitate Mary, the mother of our Lord, as the most perfect and inspiring woman. And with this book, I ended up taking the 10 virtues of St. Louis de Montfort and putting it next to a quality of the feminine genius that we can tap into, because I wanted this book to be something for women to be able to pick up and really practically imitate and come to a deeper understanding of their gifts, like your gifts, my gifts, we have these natural gifts. So things like we talked about receptivity, the maternal woman, we're all called to be mothers, be it spiritual or physical, a wise woman or discerning woman, self-sacrificial, bridal, sensitivity, nurturing, compassionate, 
a sort of protectiveness, which comes with our motherhood. So over people we love, beauty, and also a womanly strength that we see when we, you know, when we undergo labor, when we're laboring a child or, or, you know, women are strong. I mean, we can just, I, I was just talking to somebody about St. Edith Stein and they were saying what a powerhouse woman she was. And that is so true. I mean, she went to her martyrdom. There's a certain strength within us that when we're called to do something just, this this great strength rises from our hearts, even though our bodies usually smaller or we have various, you know, weaknesses, say, which comes off very provocative, but it's true. And but we have this strength that wells up from that. I think that is particular to woman. Yeah, that's true. And so to get a little bit more provocative. So some of these virtues, receptivity, obedience, humility, purity, have really been critiqued as less than by so-called women's advocates over the years. And we're kind of being taught or socialized to prize masculine virtues, you know, and or to the fact it shouldn't be controversial or make anybody upset to say that women are physically weaker than men. We are physically weaker than men. I mean, you look at some of the things that are happening in in so-called women's sports these days and women are being trounced. Why? Well, because high school male athletes in some disciplines can trump trounce Olympians, a female Olympians, because our bodies are different, but we have different strengths. And it's just crazy to think that 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 is up for debate right now in our world. We've also it's just it's crazy that we can't recognize that some of these things actually are strengths. You say docility or obedience, for example, is a a woman's strength. That's very controversial. Could you maybe explain to us a little bit about how going through this study and inviting Mary into it with us. How does this help women to recover a sense of themselves and the real gift that is their femininity, even in, or maybe especially in these strengths or not strengths, depending on who's who's looking at them? Yes. Well, I think we have to first recognize coming at all of this from modern eyes. Mm-hmm. And there is not one of us. I do not believe it. I don't, I, unless we're like totally sheltered by our parents our entire life. There is not one of us that is not at least somewhat affected by feminism. It's like fluoride being in the water. Mm-hmm. It's there. We're drinking it. And there's this upbringing that's happening in women of, of thinking we need to be like men, but not realizing that. You know, like, I, do, I don't think feminists think that they want to be men, but it takes an outside perspective, say, taking a step back from our time and saying, what is timeless femininity and timeless masculinity look like and what's happened recently what's happened i mean our lady of fatima warned us the the last battle is on marriage and family you take down the woman you take down the family you take down motherhood you take down the family i mean it's just that's that's the process that the devil would love to do and so because of that mary is the answer and so letting her come in the first step is healing we, we, there's a lot of healing that needs to take place in various areas. So I did a talk on, on the book I just, I just wrote and I was, I was listing out these topics of femininity, you know, compassion, obedience, submission, you know, all these things. And I said, if you feel like, Ooh, like I don't have any of that and I don't want to be that way. There's, there's something in there. One of us is cringing at, you know, there's something in there that's like, ugh, you know, and, and that's where the healing needs to take place recognizing these gifts that we were giving and seeing them as the gift they are. We can do that by reading scripture. I think very specifically, that is very healing. You start to see, read into biblical womanhood in light of the Catholic faith. Whoa, this is so beautiful. She is the Proverbs 31 woman. You know, she she is showing the beauty of the feminine genius. So we recognize the qualities and we have to ask for healing in them. And it's only in that healing that I think we begin to feel who we are, the gift of what woman. Sorry, held. I stop you for a second. And when we're living womanhood right now, it's very striking. Yeah. Can I, can I stop you for a second? Yeah. It, it's, it's coming through like very broken up and it's giving a bandwidth message. Is there a way for you to plug your, your computer into the internet to get maybe a better stream? Because that we kind of like missed all of that last part, and that was really important. I can't <laughs> sometimes can you when hear me. 
Yeah, I can hear you. Sometimes, just sometimes when it's over Wi-Fi, it's and there's like a lot going on traffic wise. Maybe a lot of people are using it, or if you're on the default channel of your Wi, I only know this because my husband's a tech person. But if you're on the default channel of your Wi-Fi, then everybody kind of is, and you just like there's a setting you can change, and this would be something to do later. But but if you have like an Ethernet cable or something to plug into the wall, that might solve the problem. Okay, I let me ask my husband. I don't know if okay. I have anything. If not, I mean, we can keep going, but I want to go back and do that other question again. Cause it was like every other where it was and oh, you were, you were like paused, um, like frozen. So, okay. We could just go back and you were talking about everything up to where you like, that's where you, a point where you should heal. And then I'll cut there and I'll just cut okay. this part out. So, sure. so why I think you went from, we need to heal. And then why Mary is a good example. So let's just go into that wherever you can pick okay. up your thoughts. Okay. Thinking. So I think that when we recognize the gifts and start to tap into these gifts and, and see them, then we can realize what is making us a little uncomfortable and ask for those areas of healing in prayer. Because when we actually heal from these things, we can start to see as women just how powerful it is to be a woman and to recognize who we are and what a grace and peace trying to be something we're not or trying not to be, for instance, sensitive or too emotional or, you know, we want our emotions to be steeped in reason, but also our sensitive hearts are a gift of the world and a gift to one another to be compassionate, to care about others, to have this softened heart. Because I think so many of us are told to harden and, and to be, you know, so strong that we don't feel things. And this is not, this is a sad way to live. And when we see Mary, we see that she entered into her sorrows, but she also entered into her joys. Like her capacity for joy is so increased and so big because of her suffering, her, her sorrows. And so for us, we really live out a just a sort of purity in our emotions. We can grow in that as women and and experience the world in a more real way and a more feminine way without being threatened by by men. You know, we, we don't need to compare ourselves. We don't need to compete with men. Let men be men. We want them to be men. I want men to be men, you know, and I want them to be good men. But how can I change that? Well, I can be the most woman I can be. I can have a sense about me that when a man is around me, that they want to behave in a certain manner, you know, <laughs> just my demeanor. You don't even have to say words, you know, how you carry yourself in confidence as a woman. I think it's really powerful. Yeah, I think you're right. So as a as a convert from Protestantism, I mentioned earlier, I know really well the objection that praying to or growing in relationship with Mary can feel like it encroaches on the space of worship that's really proper for Jesus alone. Now, obviously, I've come to the other side of that where I do have a relationship with and a love for Mary. Can you speak to those Protestants who are listening or maybe those who have a lot of interactions with Protestants as close friends and family? Because I think sometimes especially from the outside looking in, it looks like we can get a little bit carried away in our devotion to Mary. Sure. Well, something that I think I have noticed is there's a lot of lies that circulate about Catholics, especially in the Christian world that are actually not true. Like, I've had so many Protestant friends say, wait, you don't worship Mary? I'm like, no, no, we don't worship Mary. We honor her as the mother of the Lord. And, and so I think the first step of course is clarification so just a gentle clarification i don't i don't worship her but i honor her because she's the mother of god and and that real i guess clarity of the theotokos like thinking about that the mother of god because if jesus is both man and god that means she was the god bearer if he is truly both man and god and not just man she is truly a god bearer and that's incredible and i link it to biblical femininity because she is the biblical woman. So I think actually with Protestants, I, I pray that there's a light in this because I think that so many Protestants have an understanding of biblical femininity that's very powerful and strong in our day. And there's like a going back to the roots and more traditional ways of living and a love of homemaking and the Proverbs 31 woman and all of these things. And I think so just connecting on that level first of the biblical femininity and say, Hey, she's there. She's, she's in scripture. She's not only that, 
but look what she's done and look what her words say. They, every word is so precise and carefully chosen in the gospels of what Our Lady says. Now there's a silence about her and that's on purpose. But when we look at the words she says, she says, do whatever he tells you. First of all, she, you know, she has her Magnificat where she's glorifying God and saying, recognizing who she is and how blessed she is. She's receiving Christ into her womb and saying yes to everything, his, his life, his death, his resurrection to all of salvation history. She is giving her resounding yes. This is so powerful and an example to us to give our yes. But then you get the wedding at Cana and this is like the heart of what Our Lady does do whatever he tells you. So also just communicating gently, you know, and just that, that she leads us to Christ. And yes, we can, of course we speak to Christ. Of course we pray to him. Of course we have intimacy with him, especially through the Holy Eucharist. But of course we pray to him directly. But what's so beautiful about our lady is she takes us into really, we just can't get to, we need to be sitting by her at the cross to understand the cross. Like she was there. She knows it intimately to understand that we need her. So, so, you know, with apologetics and everything, it's nice to give a good book, but Hans books for that. Mm. I mean, wonderful book to just pass along to understand more about our lady but also i think discussion to the bit so it was breaking up a little bit there so i think you said hail holy queen by scott hahn and the second one you gave connection to the biblical woman is very helpful i'm not hearing it can you say it one more time it must be really important saint is a door pray for us really funny i yeah i don't usually get this the connection to the biblical woman is very helpful beautiful so what was he what was I gonna say oh I just and I wanted to just mention to one of the things that was really helpful for me when I was converting is understanding sometimes people say well this this issue of prayer like oh you're praying to Mary and on the one hand like if you if you're defining prayer as a conversation a mere conversation then then yes absolutely that's what's happening but if you're defining prayer as the word that you use, which I think is more, gets to the heart of the objection a little bit more of worship than, than no, there's a distinction there. And, and Mary would be the first one to say, don't worship me, turn to, turn to Jesus, turn to my son. And I think it's helpful also to look at the words of, for example, the Hail Mary, because I didn't realize this, even though I was a Protestant and I would have said, I know scripture very well, but the words of the Hail Mary are directly from scripture. They're the words of the angel Gabriel. They're the words of Elizabeth. And in saying them, we fulfill the words of scripture when Mary says, all generations will call me blessed. And by by praying and reciting those words of the Hail Mary, we're praying scripture. And when we look at the rosary, I think maybe at least from my experience, Protestants can get caught up in the physicality, but you don't need to have a physical rosary to pray the rosary. That's just a tool to help you to meditate and to say those words and and to keep track of where you are. But what's actually happening, and I didn't realize this as a Protestant from the outside looking in, because you can count on your fingers. You you don't need the, the actual physical rosary to count. But what's happening is a meditation on these mysteries of scripture. And I had no idea of that until I was already well on my way to becoming Catholic. But what Catholics are actually doing is meditating on a particular gospel story for the period of those 10 Hail Marys. So that, those are some some easy ways that you can kind of connect to Protestants. And if you're a Protestant to understand that maybe it's not your particular spirituality, it's not to your taste, but hopefully to help understand and kind of bridge the gap here and and say, you know, this isn't something that is intentionally trying to detract from Jesus. This is a, another way, another way to pray through scripture to get to Jesus. It's helpful for me. And also, I think it's just helpful to remember that this was truly, this is Christ. And there is no one that loved her more than him. There's no one that loves her more than him. So when we honor her and when we love her too, we're imitating him. Absolutely. And so going back to feminism a little bit, you and your husband just released a podcast series on the work of Alice von Hildebrand, who along with G.K. Chesterton, who's quoted 
over and over again in in the book that you were discussing. She's just a, a scathing critic of feminism and what it's done to women, to marriages, to motherhood. What are, I mean, we've already discussed a few of them, but let's let's call them up again specifically here. What are the problems that are inherent to feminism and what do you suggest as an alternative way forward for women? Yes. So I think when Alfon Heldebrand is talking, she's very clearly discussing the issue of third wave feminism, particularly. So trying to get women outside the home, not being mothers, sterilizing themselves and um, competing with men and trying to be like men. So just for a definition here, this is what we're dealing with. So we, and there's a real pride in that too, in this fight, in this battle. So we're not talking about, like, just to make it clear, we're not talking about women being equal in dignity to men. You know, we're complementary in nature, but we're equal in dignity. There's there's no doubt about it. We should be treated with dignity. So that is not that is not what we're talking about when we're talking about feminism. The problem with this is we lose our identity as women. We find that women are, there's so many statistics coming out, more unhappy than ever. There's a falling apart of the family we've seen with the onset of contraception. First of all, women being used all the more in this. Once you take the responsibility out of love, yeah, there, there's there's a problem there. And you see the onset of abortion. So we have all these babies dying. And and we see the breaking down of the family with so with just massive amounts of divorce and unhappiness and instability within the family. So that, that's the result of what's happened. And where I think I I think maybe I'm being too hopeful, but I think a lot of us in our age bracket are beginning to see this mm-hmm. and that there is a movement of sort of looking at more traditional values and ways. And I think the greatest thing we can do to fight this battle is instead of being concerned about society as a whole and, you know, worrying about everyone else, we think about ourselves. How can I live out my femininity? What, you know, what is God calling me to do? Because each family is going to look different. And economically, things are very hard right now for a lot of families. It's just without a doubt, that's the truth. What can I do to be the wife I want to be? What can I do to be the mother I want to be? How can I make a home? I think this is really important. So because so many women are out in the workforce, we're we're finding a lack of homemaking. We, we've lost our homemaking skills. We, we, we need to learn how to sew, how to bake bread, all these things. Because when you make a home to be in the home, your children, you know, but if there's no home, you kind of just live outside the home, right? Want to be in the home. So it's, of, it's, it's if we were talking about a woman gift of beauty, particular gift, women, their gift of creating beauty and in, but yeah, and she can she can bring this into whatever she's doing, of course. But but this is really important. So I think looking at those things, those values, saying what can I do to a very strong family culture? What can I do to be a very loving wife? And think about, instead of, you know, critiquing my husband so much, like, what can I do about as present as possible in my circumstance that the Lord has? Me? How, how can I be, uh, you know, without that, mom, we don't, but how can I be present to these children? How can I raise them to, in virtue to be saints? And then how can I be the most woman I can be? How can I know, live as feminine gifts that God has given me? So that I am a pure gift, like that is pure gift to the world. When we know who we are and we know our gifts and we give back, it's a powerful thing in the world. That is, that is beautiful. And I think ultimately it comes down to a love of motherhood, be it spiritual or physical. So we need to value motherhood again. It's important. Absolutely. So I want to read this quotation on receptivity directly from chapter two. It may sound easy to us in theory to rejoice in the gift, but there are so many circumstances where we receive gifts from God and struggle to rejoice in them. Perhaps we're overwhelmed with worry. If I take on this new promotion at work, it will require more hours. I did not plan another pregnancy so quickly. Will it be too hard? I'm not sure I'm ready to get married, but now this wonderful man has walked into my life and I would love to spend my life with him. There are so many circumstances where God desires to give us gifts that though they make us happy, 
bring a weight of responsibility we may feel hesitant to take on. But love always comes with responsibility. Love always comes with sacrifice. And though it is against our fallen human nature to want anything to be trying or difficult, the great things we receive in life will always come with a portion of suffering and sacrifice. The servant will be called to imitate her master to be like Jesus. Gosh, that is so beautiful. And it just, it really resonates, especially on a podcast on Catholic bioethics, because so much of it stems from our teachings on sexuality and against contraception. And I think you hit the nail on the head here that receiving God's gifts sometimes comes with a weight of responsibility that we hesitate to take on. Can you share how receptivity has played a role in your life? And what would you say to the woman who's really struggling with that receptivity right now? Yes. Well, receptivity is manifested in numerous ways. So we'll just talk about it in light of this passage that I wrote in the book, of course. And prior to this, I talk about being emptied. So that's that's going to be a part of all of our journeys is this being emptied. We're going to have seasons in our life, whatever it might be. It's going to be different for all of us. And and spiritually being emptied too. There's there's like an element that we need, us need in our life so that we can make space for Christ. And so in first being emptied, that's the first step to receptivity. So allowing ourselves, our hearts to be emptied of our desires, our wants, our, you know, all of our dreams, like all of these things, it's not to say they're bad, but a lot of things need to be purified. And so when we empty of ourselves, meaning to God completely, whatever it is, whatever it is we want, we desire, we're dreaming of, give it to God completely and saying, I trust you with this. I'm going to take you like, take it out of my heart and give it to you. And that leaves more space. And then you get these gifts. And what I was talking about in this passage is how sometimes there's actually a struggle for joy in those gifts. Mm -hmm. So we think about like the responsibility that comes with it or the negative thing. And part of what our lady teaches us is to be truly joyful and rejoice in the gifts we're given. Rejoice in the gifts we're given as women. Rejoice in the gifts that we're given in our daily lives. So in these circumstances, for instance, a woman wanting to get married and but being a bit fearful about it. And and like there's this wonderful man in her life. And she's like, I just don't know. I don't, you know, can I, is this the right time? But it's so clear that she's, you know, he's the right man and it would be a good and holy fit. It, you know, just making that, taking that leap of faith and rejoicing in what's before her. The same thing with the baby thing. So like, okay, a baby comes and maybe we don't feel ready or something. A baby is always a gift. And so we can just rejoice in it. Just let's, let's let go of that heaviness that we just hold on to and enter into that freedom of rejoicing. And, and right after this, I talk about the, our lady and the, the Magnificat, how she rejoiced in the gift of Christ. But I, I would say she had a real sense of what she was saying yes to. There is a real responsibility. When she said yes, again, she said yes to his whole life, which meant death on the cross as well. But in that moment, she knew she was supposed to rejoice. And when the hard things come, when we're entering into the gift of marriage, baby, promotion at work, whatever it is, whatever state of life we're in, there's going to be new responsibilities. And that's what makes life good. Like we're made for hard things. It makes it fulfilling. It deepens our love. It deepens our sense of work our and our virtue. We grow as human beings in character. So beautiful. So thank you so much for being here today. Is there anything else we haven't already discussed that you think listeners should know? I think, I mean, that's, that's definitely the the fullness of my mission is really, you know, touching on these things. I touch about the external expression of femininity, but also the internal, you know, like, of course, the heart of woman is the most important. I think that the body and soul being united, like both these things matter. And then in the end, the reason I wrote Mary Teach Me to Be Your Daughter is because Mary is the ultimate end of femininity. She is the perfect example and inspiration to us. She is the perfect mother. She's there to nurture us, to help us along the way to heaven. And if we, to be the most woman we can be is to be 
like to be clothed. In. So just thinking about what that means, at least speaking, just put on her virtues. You know, we, we have that so much in scripture, this, this idea of like putting on Christ, right. And putting on, there's so many, you know, visuals with garments and things like that. And, and I like to think about this as putting on Mary as women. I think this is, this is the heart of what I'm trying to speak. And that's why I wrote the book. Beautiful. So when listeners are are receiving this, where can they connect with you and find your book? Yes. So I have an Instagram called a mother's lace. I have a website, a mother's lace.com and Mary teach me to be your daughter is published by Ascension press. You can find it on there and it just released on Amazon as well, both in Burma and ebook. Congrats. That's so exciting. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for being that witness and that salt and light in the world. God bless. Thank you, Samantha.